So Steve, I hear you've been finishing some beef on native grasses. How's that going for you? Well, it works very well for me. You know, I, I get growth animals on two different weights. One is stalkers, you know, five, 600 pounds that I just run for the summer and then sell. And I have some that are higher weight ones that I uh, pick up in the eight, 900 pound range, uh, either as I buy them or I custom graze them for another producer. And uh, those are finished on grass right to the to the slaughter pen, right to the butcher. And uh, I either have some customers or a, custom, a guy that I custom graze for has customers. And, and uh, it works well from the standpoint of the, the, the gain. You want to, the native grasses uh, impart a flavor to the animals that they're, when they're on it, according to the people that have done research on grass finishing. It varies with what they're eating, you know, the kind of uh, forage uh, and the rate of gain that they have on that forage. So uh, I have had my own customers say they really like the flavor of, of the native warm season grasses. Yeah. I have a, I belong to a Patchburn working group that goes around to different meetings every year. A guy in North Texas, they were just getting into it. They said, we grain finish as well as grass finish. And our grain grass finish customers say they really like the flavor of the native warm season grasses. They can tell it different from either the grain fed or in their cases, they had some whole world blue stem. They said they could tell the difference. So it's, it's maybe not scientifically documented, but it's customer uh, uh, observed and, and commented upon. Yeah. Yeah. So flavor is good. Flavor is good. It's distinct. You, you know, you get different things. Grain. I could tell people if you want it to taste like chicken, feed them grain. If you want it to taste like something else, you know, feed them grass. But cool season, the uh, legume can give them part of different flavor and the native grass, a totally different flavor. Yeah. Yeah. So can we get a nice fat? And, you know, I like my steaks juicy and tender and fat. So, you know, you don't want them lean and tough as rubber. No, you don't. Um, how, how's this go? Can we put weight, like put the fat on them with the native forages? You can, and especially with the native forages. You'll have a, uh, the butchers want a fat rind on the outside. It'll usually be fat, uh, yellow versus white. And they want just enough rind on the outside that they can hang the animal and age it without the carcass drying out, you know, 14 in 14 days. Then you want a little bit of marbling inside, and it won't be the same as grain finished. Uh, lots of marbling, which may be too much, but it will have some marbling inside the, the steaks and what have you that allow it to be tender. But there again, it becomes also the art of how you prepare it. Don't throw it on a 700 degree grill and expect it not to be as tough as a, as a shoe sole, but right. cook it slow and, and uh, down around two, you know, two and a quarter, keep it slow, and it'll be a tender, juicy flavor of meat. Yeah, yeah. So you're able to get the condition on the animal, get that, get it to finished condition, if you will, on these natives. Yes. Yeah. There is a, a, an art to it. It's not a science. Uh, anybody that tells you when you graze them, it's just art. It's art. And it varies, and sometimes you feel like, what I do wrong? And it, you know, I thought I was doing right. But the researchers on it, there's one in in, in uh, Argentina that's really good about grass finish, not knowing anything about native. But he said you want to have an average daily rate of gain of 1.65 uh, pounds per day gain to keep ensure a, a tender, flavorful piece of meat. And that's in the finishing period. In the finished yeah. product. So you not like something you could gray them every day and make sure you're getting that. So you just, during the course of the season, you want to make sure you stayed above that rate. And uh, some of you, you take them off a little early and you found you were blow. Well, okay, you want to finish, you know, take them off a little earlier next year or do something a little different. But you want that, that rate of gain to average 1.65. And you fall below that, you're getting off flavors and tougher meat. And uh, th as long as we're doing it on native grasses up through the early part of August, we can stay above that 1.65 average daily rate of gain. So yeah, that May through, like maybe early May through sometime in August, you're yes. hitting above 1.65, somewhere probably up sure. right around two. Is that sure. where you're yeah. at? I, you know, I have gotten uh, in May, June, and July, 2.98, you know, for that period. There's an old rule of thumb that the case data is documented. Ranchers in Kansas will tell you that you'll get four pounds a day gain on native grasses in May, three in June, a two in July, and one in August. And 
how you manage that grass according to rotation, keeping it shorter, doesn't change that. It's the maturity of the grass, the phenology of the grass that comes into play that you can't alter. But that's the, as it goes through the, that, that period, you uh, want to make sure you get them on there early to get that four pounds early and never, uh, not instead of later when you'd only get three or two and a half. By cool season comparison, you might get two, still good. But compare that to th four and three and two and a half, yeah, you, know, you want to be, you can get that out of the warm season pretty easy. So there's this whole new thought <coughs> system that I'm seeing come and a lot of research um, that's being started and looked at about like the plant secondary compounds in the meat and the like health benefits that I can get from the, um, from the meat. So like, does it matter if it was it raised on corn or finished on corn or if it was finished on grass? Like, is there a health benefit difference to me as the consumer of the meat? And some of the stuff that I've seen is like any piece of meat that you get from any beef animal will provide certain things, provide protein, provide some minerals, that sort of stuff. If you finish it on grass, it also throws in the benefit of like the conjugated linoleic acids, the omega-3s, that sort of thing. But then if you finish it on a diversity of plants, which you've really got here, and as I look that way, I see more diversity oh, yeah. than even this way. But we've got the native forbs and legumes here. We've got the native warm season grasses. So when you add that diversity in, then you pick up these plant secondary compounds. So it's kind of like, you know, the stuff that makes the chili peppers hot. Well, that's a plant secondary compound that can have benefits actually to our body, help us handle heat better, sure. that sort of thing. So the meat can accumulate those plant secondary compounds and then we eat the meat, we get them or the milk as well. So I hear that you had some testing done on one of your steaks that you raised out here on this very piece of land. Tell us what happened on that. Well, just last year I was custom grazing for Adam Bowman and he's with the, has, with the Forage and Grasslands Council of Missouri. And uh, one of the animals that I finished for him, he had processed and he had another animal that uh, another fella uh, finished, and he took a cut of that, had it processed or test tested. Uh, this particular track had, as he noticed when he's here, had lots more forbs, uh, max billing, sunflower, ashy, and a lot of other plants that aren't thought of and the real, you know, don't give you weepy eyes thinking about how pretty they are, maybe asters and things that animals are still eating. Right. So they're getting forbs and, and the compounds from those forbs, they're here too. The other grass finished animal was a lot more pure native warm season grass. Both of those steaks tested in Utah to lab were higher in the omega-3 fatty acids than the CLAs, but the secondary compounds were way up. And compared to traditional grass finished on cool season and also compared to grain finished. I can't begin to cite the compounds, you know, they're word twist, twisty worders names, but the, they were way higher on those two grass, native warm season grass finished, but on mine, on or the, his off the, this mine with Forbes was another level above the straight grass one. So we feel like that was stuff they got from the native forbs, sunflowers, and the other uh, plants that uh, they were eating out here that gave them those compounds and healthy yeah. factors. Really significant. It was darling how much difference he presented in a program last May, I think, or March that uh, was, was kind of eye-opening. Yeah. So we can finish them out here. We get a really high-quality product as far as, like, health benefits to the meat and that sort of thing. Um, getting tenderness is not always guaranteed with any way you finish an animal, but can get a nice tender uh, animal raised on this forage, can get a nice amount of fat marbled into that meat. Looks like a great way to finish animals. Is that is, I your think point? that's why everybody liked to eat buffalo 100 years ago, you know, and now they can't do that, or bison. But uh, we can do it pretty well with cattle. And uh, uh, it's it's been a real eye-opening experience. and. So I hear that some people, your operation is all perennial plants. You don't, you're not planting any na or warm season annuals or cover crops or anything like that. But I hear some people are coupling this with like other forages to get more. This is wonderful forage, May, April, June, uh, sorry, 
May, June, July, I can't get my orders, months in order. Yeah. Uh, starting to decline a little bit in August, but still pretty decent forage. Um, but then, so that's a nice four months there. Um, but what about the rest of the year? How can you couple the natives or what have you heard or seen other people doing to couple natives with the other, because this is a low maintenance, high sure. tonnage producing, like we don't have to plant it every year. The cost is lower. Cost is... Um, so how do we couple this with other things to do longer finishing periods? Well, you mentioned it, you know, and the way you have to do it really to have a quality product is to has to be some kind of farmed annuals. I'm not set up to plow an acreage up uh, and plant it to forage cocktail mix, forage sorghums, uh, you know, a, 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 a diverse mix of of grass and, and forbs like soybean, grazing soybeans and grazing corn and the like. But that would be the way to do it. Late fall from August up to, you know, getting up to the first almost of October before you could take a boom to a cool season combination. That's the way to do it. Because the other thing we know from the research like Aunt Poor Domingo did that uh, is that going to a perennial cool season back to a high quality, you know, brome orchard, Timothy, even, you know, fescue with lots of goom won't do it. It doesn't have that energy in the fall to maintain that rate of growth and tenderness. You has to be a, a cereal annual crop to have the energy to maintain those rates of gain. Consequently, my animals go to slaughter by the middle of August. As soon as I can get a processing date, which I sometimes schedule way, way out, to get a processing date in August. And that doesn't always, isn't the sometimes the preferred time for when they want, oh, I want cool weather to process an animal. You know, you're, you're stuck right. with that date without a forage annual. If you had the forage annuals to go to and you could go into November and pull them off and still have a, a that rate again, you got to maintain that on the annuals as well, which is easily done. And uh, uh, with continuous or rotation, uh, but you have to have something to pick them up at the end. That's the one thing I'm stuck on in, in August is I have to process or sell. Yeah. So any one last piece of advice you'd have to people on that want to start finishing on natives or maybe they've got the natives planted, maybe they don't, but they are finishing beef or they want to finish beef. Any last piece of advice? Uh, get as good a quality animals as you can find. Uh, either hard to do at the local sale barn, not because they don't have good animals, you just don't know what they are. I mean, it's it's it's. Like I've said, the, process, the, the producer doesn't know because these animals usually go to the on-sale barn here or sees them again. But uh, get as good as what you can think you can get and can afford to pry, pay on and uh, or find a, a, a grower that uh, has uh, what you perceive as good animals. There again, I've had got some growers and they thought they had the best quality in the world. And it was according to the bulls they bought and all like. But uh, that doesn't mean anything on native warm season grass because they've not been tested on that. Right. So you're looking for a grass-based type genetics. Yep, they yep. really finish better on yep. grass. Uh, and the long haul of it, if there was a suite of us that were doing grass finish, we'd all be together. We'd all fin fill in the gaps that each of us needed. But that that system doesn't exist, <laughs> at least not very many places, not close by. Yep, yep. So one last piece of thing, Steve, related to get the good genetics. I hear that you have a big preference for a certain color of animals when you're grazing out here on these native grasslands in the summer. I do, I do, and I've had that over time. And I said, you know, when I work down here in the shed or working on the putting fence, and you watch the animals uh, laying in this, and they all go over and lay in the shade. A little bit of standing in the water too, if they get access to water to stand in. But they certainly lay in the shade in the heat of the day. And when the course is working and it and uh, gets torn toward four or five o'clock, you see some animals come out and start grazing and then some more come out and i've noticed that it relates to color more often than anything else and i have an assortment of colors in my animals that i buy i tell people i first bought some white animals because they were easier for me to find in the pasture i'd walk down there oh there they are over there i see the white ones so i picked up my first four or so because they were they, for that reason I had a mix of black and red, dark red, which was probably you know, red Angus and some other combinations, and some that were kind of yellow, not very many, a chocolate, which I won't be able to say much, I haven't had many of those, but and I have some Angus, you know, crosses, and I always have a few. But I got to noticing in the course of the day, the white ones went out and started eating first, then the yellow ones or light colored ones, 
and then the red ones and the last ones that come out of that shade were the black ones. And then you can appreciate that. Black is a it absorbs more heat. It gets hot. You know, there's ther the research shows that surface temperature of the hide is 130 degrees in the sun. So they they uh, don't seem to eat as much during the course of the day, or you mean to spend as much time eating during the course of the day. So after a time, I got to where I went back through all my records of when I bought animals and I sold them and I classed them according to the color, and I grouped them up that way. And over since 2013 to 2025, and uh, you know you don't always sell them just the black ones one day, so it's a little bit of uh, average in there for sure. But enough when you group them all together that I found if I use the black ones as a certain as the baseline, that I was finding that the group that were red was gaining 20 pounds more per summer uh, than the black ones. And the yellow ones uh, were 50 pounds more than the black ones. And the white or light colored or combination there was sometimes 70 and 90% pounds more than the black ones. And I look where I thought, oh, it's hybrid bigger. Yeah, there's probably some, could be some hybrid bigger woven into that, but not exclusively can be contributed, in my opinion, to hybrid. It's, yeah. it's the, the ha happiness of the animal grazing in the heat of the day. Yeah. And the amount of time they are out there eating and, and consuming forages, and it uh, shows that the, the lighter colored animals gain better in, in hot summer on native grasses than the dark colored animals. And the other thing is, I don't want, I always have some because I can make this comparison. The black eyes and black ones did exceptionally well, but as a rule, they didn't as well. And they also, if you have too many of them, they will control the behavior and the movement of that herd. If there's too many black ones in the group, they'll go to shade quicker, they'll go to water quicker, and they'll stay there longer, and they come back. The others will say, well, they're not coming back. I guess I will. I'll go out and eat myself, you know. So it, it, you don't want, you know, I'm going to say 10 to 20 percent of your group is black. And uh, there again, I think uh, most of the producers don't know that. doesn't matter to them because they're selling kids. Yeah. So they get more for a black calf than they do a red or a white calf. That's the way they go. Uh, but as a producer, that is, is or a stalker that's buying animals and, and making my profit based on uh, gain or the margin between the two. And at time I was getting the yellows and the yellows cheaper. Not anymore, they're all the same higher price. But so now you gotta make it on the, on the margin of gain. And that gain's better on the lighter colored animal. So I don't think if, he's to, if your favorite cattle color is black, or whatever your favorite cattle color is. Steve's not gonna hate you just because you keep raising black ones, but it is an interesting thing to me. And so that's why I wanted you to share it because like sometimes we don't have the choice, right? The sure. one, we're raising sure. our own or whatever. But if we do have the choice, um, it's something that we might wanna factor in when we're grass finishing on natives and it's a summer thing, yep. um, heat thing in the summer. And that's why I didn't wear a black shirt out here today. Uh, me too. You know, see, if both in light colored shirts, we know we've been there in, right. in a dark colored shirt. It gets hot, <laughs> and uh, don't need that. But you know, pick the lighter animals if you're going to do grain and and stalker operation, and if you're selling them a sale barn, you know, do what do whatever you want, want to do. But uh, I like the light colored animals. Right. Well, I'm Elizabeth with Hamilton Native Outpost. We raise native grass and wildflower seed. And it's been fun to be out here with Steve today because Steve has a whole host of experience teaching people to manage native grasslands. He's a wildlife biologist by training as well. And then he also manages cattle on his own now at this point in his life. So it's been fun to be out here with you, Steve. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Enjoyed it. We at Hamilton Native Outpost make these videos to share the unique knowledge that we have gained from over 40 years of working with native plants as we raise and sell native grass and wildflower seeds. If you found this video helpful, we need your help to get the message out. Please subscribe, share, like, and comment. It helps others to find us. Thank you.